This is Fresh Air. I'm Dave Davies, in today for Terry Gross. If you've been around a few decades, you might remember driving with your parents on a highway and seeing the windshield of your car become pocked with the carcasses of countless bugs who met their end with vehicular contact. Well, you may not have noticed, but there are far fewer bug smudges on windshields and headlights these days. Our guest, science writer Oliver Millman, says that's just one measure of a phenomenon that could spell trouble for humans, the striking decline in insect populations around the world. Driven by habitat loss, pesticides, and global warming, the collapse of insect species means more than the loss of biological diversity on the planet. Many insects play critical roles as pollinators, not just bees, but flies that pollinate vegetable plants and midges essential to the reproduction of cocoa plants. Other insects break down rotting plant and animal waste to release nutrients and nourish soil, and many insects are critical parts of the food chain. If they disappear, the birds and other animals who eat them starve, putting the larger mammals who prey on them in trouble. Millman's new book describes evidence of the insect again, as some call it, and what scientists think can be done about it. Oliver Millman is a British journalist who's the environmental correspondent at The Guardian. His new book is The Insect Crisis, The Fall of the Tiny Empires That Run the World. Well, Oliver Millman, welcome to Fresh Air. You know, I'm wondering, before you got into this subject and started doing this research, did you think much about insects? I didn't much. I think like many of us, I barely thought much of them other than to think of them as an occasional annoyance. I mean, I remember as a as a child turning over stones and marvelling at ants and the kind of complex societies they um, managed to construct underground. Um, and obviously, as I got older, I appreciated bees and butterflies and many of the other kind of things that are beautiful in our world. But I suppose like many people, I, I was annoyed by mosquitoes, obviously found uh, cockroaches revolting, um, and even getting into journalism and writing about the environment um, and the natural world around us, I didn't pay too much attention really to insects. A, a lot of the attention, a lot of the focus is drawn to these big charismatic creatures that uh, are under threat due to the biological crisis we find ourselves in, the, the rhinos and the, the lions and the orangutans and so on. And so insects were never really top of mind for me, either professionally or um, personally, but um, certainly that, that changed in the course of writing this book. I mean, your, your book tests this thesis that the decline of insect populations is really a threat to other parts of the natural world and humanity. So let's talk about some of the ways that insects are important in ways that people may not realize. One of them is, is in pollinating plants, many of them that we rely on for food. I mean, we all know about bees and how particularly honeybee populations have been threatened, but they aren't the only ones. What are some other insects that are critical pollinators? So you, you're right in saying that um, the bees get a lot of the um, focus and the attention when it comes to pollination, but there's a whole array of insects that provide that uh, pollination service. In, in fact, there's three quarters of the world's flowering plants and about a third of the world's food crops depend on pollinators at, at some stage. And so um, it's, it's not just uh, bees. We're thinking about um, flies. Flies are huge pollinators. That includes the midges that um, pollinate the, um, the cocoa crop that um, chocolate comes from. Um, and there are wasps as well. Wasps are, are major pollinators. Uh, again, another insect that's widely disliked, but actually crucial for our environment. And without these creatures, we would we'd be without apples, cranberries, melons, uh, almonds, broccoli, blueberries, cherries. I mean, the list goes on and on. I mean, we'd even be without um, uh, ice cream because alfalfa is uh, pollinated by insects that um, uh, is fed to cows to produce ice cream. So we'd be out without many of the kind of staples of our lives, maybe the luxuries of our lives. Um, you know, curries would become a historical dish because cardamom would uh, not be there, cumin would not be there, many of the kind of spices, many of the things that make our diets kind of colourful, interesting and nutritious is uh, would be stripped from our lives without insects. And I think that's a really important thing to think about when we're thinking about pollinator declines because many of the world's poor um, rely upon um, agriculture that's 
directly pollinated in their immediate surrounds. And without that, a lot of the nutrition is stripped from their diets. Malnutrition rates start to climb. There was one study that found that there will be an extra million deaths a year from conditions such as heart disease because of um, uh, malnutrition and, and poor diets caused by pollinated declines. And the UN has warned that this is going to become a food security issue, something that, that the world needs to focus on um, quite acutely. So I think when it comes to food pollination, that's probably the primary thing that we, uh, we should be thinking about when it comes to insect declines in terms of our own health and well-being. Insects are also food for birds and other animals. How important are they as the base of the food chain? Well, they are. Once you kind of yank insects out of the base of the food chain, everything kind of starts toppling away from, from above them, really. I mean, they, they're crucial in terms of just the basic foundations of forests and grassland ecosystems. Uh, when you're thinking about the replenishment of soils, the cycling of nitrogen through the through the soils that ensures that plants grow, um, and then as you say, as food themselves. I mean, we may hate mosquitoes, but they provide a huge amount of food to frogs, and then uh, also birds. And once you cut, start climbing up the the food chain, you start affecting things that we really do uh, value. So there's, there's as well as these declines. Uh, that have been documented in insects, bird numbers have been um, reported to be down in, in several countries. And, and the, the birds that eat insects are, the, are, the, are faring far worse than the, the, bo- the birds that are omnivorous, such as uh, crows, for example. So um, they provide uh, a really important base to the, to the food pyramid, uh, and they provide a really crucial part of uh, of our overall environment i mean the world our surroundings would be far quieter far duller far drabber without insects um, to actually go through an environment where insects are plentiful well, as they once were before human interference um disturbed that uh, is to be transported into another place entirely it's a place that's kind of humming with life insects all around you they um bash up against your legs and your face you can hear them you can see them it's it's a very alive, verdant place, and without them, it's uh, the world would be a much poorer place indeed. Yeah, you, you open the book with an apocalyptic vision of the depletion of the Earth's insects, and with the understanding that this is a scenario, not necessarily a prediction. Just share that image with us. What happens in the worst case? So, yeah, we, we're unlikely to um, see a world without insects. Pretty much every expert I, I spoke to um, said that we would probably go before them in terms of our presence on Earth. So um, we are unlikely to see this. But in terms of uh, an idea of what the world would be like without insects, it would be an extremely grim place. Um, the biologist E.O. Wilson, who passed recently, he predicted we would only last a few months without insects. Um, it would be a, a, a place of mass starvation. It'd be a place where there would be rotting feces and corpses everywhere because dung beetles and other insects that break down those um, materials would be gone. Uh, it would be a place that also be, like I was saying before, much quieter, much duller, much drabber. Um, the, the food insecurity issue would um, grip the world's poorest, but then everybody else would then suffer from that too. You would have certainly mass starvation, um, societal unrest uh, and you could imagine how things would go from there I mean much of the world's um, uh, basic foods would would go uh, uh, governments would obviously have to scramble in some way to, to deal with this situation but there is not the technology uh, nor the understanding of what insects do still in our world to replace them so it would be quite a futile exercise in many ways um, it would be a, a, an extremely Um, dire place to live in and certainly not something we should ever aim for. There's also just the marvel of diversity in the insect world. You describe some pretty bizarre (laughs) insects. You want to share a couple of favorites with us? Yeah, I mean, you can spend forever learning about uh, insects and, and the things they do because there's so many of them and yet so many of them are still unknown to us. I mean, there's one million known species of insect, but the, it's estimated there's maybe 5 million, 10 million, maybe 30 million um, species of insect that we don't know about yet. Um, and the ones we do know about, we're learning about new things about them all the time. I mean, I'm, I'm a very big fan of the, the caterpillars that can generate their antifreeze to ward off the cold. That seems like an incredible... Um, 
uh, ability to me. There's a water beetle that once it's eaten by a frog can actually escape from its um, rear end. The, uh, the frog's rear end to actually escape being eaten by the frog. Um, there's, uh, I mean, even insects that we revile are, are extremely impressive when you think about them objectively. I mean, cockroaches can last two weeks after being beheaded. They can run at incredible speeds. They can um, survive huge amounts of um, uh, uh, poison and radiation even. Um, bees in themselves are just incredible creatures just in terms of their um, logistical work, their ability to um, organise socially. Um, honeybees can un understand the concepts of zero and can add and subtract numbers. You have bumblebees that researchers have found can be can play soccer. They can learn to play soccer with a, with a food reward. Um, and there are... Um, uh, bees that can detect landmines as well. I mean, there's all kinds of incredible things that they can do uh, with their um, uh, with their minds for such small creatures. Um, and so, the more you learn about them, I think the more you're enamoured with them, and you, the warmer you feel about insects, the more you you discover how incredible they they, uh, they really are. You know, you've mentioned cockroaches and their durability. Why are they so tough? Why do they survive things that others don't? Yeah, well, cockroaches are, um, if there was one great survivor in the insect world, it would be, uh, would be the cockroach. I mean, there are kind of several thousand species. Two of them are the ones that we know about the most of all, the German and the American cockroach, because those are the ones that have adapted themselves and kind of ideally to our, to our homes. So the ones you see scuffling around and either shriek or try and stamp on them. Um, but they, they are um, incredibly... Um, uh, durable. They have uh, chemicals in them that um, scientists have been trying to extract for medicines uh, to help uh, combat uh, antibiotic resistance. Um, so that helps them ward off pretty much any kind of disease going along. Most poisons that aim to them um, seem to seem to fail. Um, they have very strong bites. They can fit into tiny cracks about this, the width of a of a small coin. Um, they they can crash into walls at high speed and then ascend uh, vertically. I mean they are almost the superheroes of insects because they have these kind of extraordinary abilities, um, and that's allowed them to um, not only survive our. Uh, our kind of domination of this planet, but she prosper in it. Can they survive intense radiation? Do we know? They they can up to a point, <laughs> but they there there is that obviously that uh, idea that they would be the last thing remaining after a, a nuclear um, uh, kind of winter. But um, uh, I think even they with their nuclear weapons would uh, probably perish. Uh, but um, they are extremely durable, extremely hardy. You know, our awareness of this loss of insect populations, you write, can be almost traced back to a specific date in 2017. What happened then? So in 2017, this um, piece of research came out in, in a journal that was compiled by um, researchers in Germany uh, and the Netherlands and the UK, and essentially looked at one of the only data sets there really is, has, was up to that point looking at insect populations stretching back several decades. So if you look back at the history of insect research, you have, you know, incredible work done looking at new species, new behaviours. You have kind of celebrity kind of fans. Winston Churchill kept butterflies to help aid his depression and uh, Nabokov kept um, butterfly genitals at the at Harvard's museum. Um, so the, there's always been uh, this kind of fandom of insects insects um, and passion for them, but nobody really thought about counting them. Uh, it seemed like a dull and kind of rather pointless thing to do because insects are so legion. But um, what the researchers in uh, Germany had done is this entomological society there, um, they'd actually been trapping insects back uh, decades and they actually started to look through their data and realised something was seriously amiss. I mean, there had been uh, kind of informal conversations about how they were seeing fewer and fewer insects in the countryside. But um, when they actually looked through the, the data, it was startling. The actual annual average weight of flying insects caught in traps there had slumped by 76% since 1989. Uh, and the situation in the height of summer, which was when insects kind of reached their apex in terms of numbers, was even worse. It was kind of down 82%. And these are quite astonishing declines when you think about 
quite a stable part of Germany. These these traps are in nature preserves. They're not in kind of industrialised areas or areas where you expect such such big declines. So it really kind of grabbed the attention of the scientific world and then also the public. The public then became... Um, introduced this idea of insect Armageddon or insect Armageddon or and the insect crisis. It started being shouted about in um, the Washington Post and the New York Times, um, uh, newspapers and media outlets across Europe as well. Um, so suddenly that became, you know, on the agenda. Pe- the public m- was made aware of this decline, and and scientists started to think, well, if it was happening in Germany, where else was it happening? Yeah, you know, the book describes evidence, very, very persuasive evidence that there are specific insect species that have suffered alarming declines in their populations. I mean, the monarch butterfly is one, obviously various bee species too. Earlier, we talked about the critical role that insects play in pollinating our plants and being the base of the food chain. And I'm wondering, have you seen the secondary effects yet? Have you seen, you know, plants that we rely on for food crops failing because insects aren't around? Or are you seeing declines in bird or other populations that feed on these insects? Yeah, we already are seeing declines in bird numbers. I mean, that was the basis of one of the most kind of eye-catching studies that I saw by this uh, guy called Anders Papimola, who's a scientist in Denmark. And he noticed that um, in rural Denmark, where he grew up, there just seemed to be far fewer birds than there once were. And he, he wondered if that was linked to insect decline. So he, he undertook this rather eccentric um, study that's still underway, whereby he got into a kind of old beat-up 1960s uh, Ford Anglia car, hit about 30, 40 miles an hour, and um, waited for bugs to hit his uh, windshield. And he's been driving up and down the same stretch of road in Denmark um, every summer since 1997 doing this. And and some of the declines he's found are, found are absolutely incredible, and down 97% um, along the longest stretch of road that he's been driving down. Um, and so he he kind of, in his study, explicitly linked that um, decline in insects to the decline in, in birds. And when you look elsewhere, there are similar declines. You've got um, uh, drops in birds such as warblers and swallows and bluebirds, birds that really um, depend on insects as their, as their main food source. Um, huge declines of birds in Germany, in France. Um, you've seen um, similar uh, declines of certain bird species in the US and Canada too. And um, scientists are increasingly linking the kind of lack of insects and also the, the upward kind of cascading effects of pesticide uh, poisoning to that. And what about the threat of fruits and vegetables and spices that we rely on disappearing because we're losing their pollinators? Yeah, well, there, there's already evidence that that big fear, the fear of um, food insecurity is starting to play out. There's, there's The loss of bees has already started to limit the supply of key food crops such as apples and blueberries and cherries. You've got some places in China where the, the, the loss of insects is so great that um, armies of people have been um, told to kind of fan out and go through orchards with kind of paintbrushes and feathers on sticks to pollinate um, crops by hand, a hugely kind of labor-intensive operation that obviously isn't really sustainable long term. Um, we need the insects around to do these jobs as they've done them for millions of years. So there is this kind of r- growing kind of rumble of concern about um, food insecurity, especially when you think about what's happening with the overall trends. I mean, the the world's population is is growing. Um, the, there's been a kind of 300% increase in the volume of agricultural production dependent on animal pollination in, in the last... F- 50 years. So we're losing pollinators at a time when we're demanding more and more pollination. We we have more mouths to feed. We need more farmland. We need more intensively uh, farmed farmland in order to feed them. Uh, And at at this kind of crucial moment, um, we're losing the pollinators able to do that for us. Let's just talk a bit about what has caused this decline in insect populations. It seems some of them are pretty clear and they're all Related to human civilization, I mean, one is the loss of habitat, right? We tend, I think we tend to think of destruction of rainforests, you know, in tropical regions as the big issue in habitat destruction. But uh, this really goes all over the place, doesn't it? What are some of the ways we're laying waste to the 
insects' homes and feeding grounds. Yes, I mean, like you say, when we think about habitat loss, we think about the idea of the Amazon rainforest being burnt down or, or chopped down. Um, but, I mean, a lot of the, the habitat loss is far more mundane. It's the conversion of a barren piece of land or seemingly barren piece of land into a Starbucks. It's the, the conversion of a, a field where wildflowers will grow into a field of soy or corn or another um, single crop. It's it's largely driven by agriculture. Uh, some of it is also driven by urban sprawl, the use, you know, the laying down of highways, of heavy industry, and so on. So, um, it's obviously a model that's um, exploded in um, Europe and, and North America, and that, that model's been transported elsewhere. You're seeing um, other countries adopt this uh, method of farming large fields of single crops, um, dousing them with insecticides and other chemicals. Uh, in order to um, boost their yield. So a lot of what we consider unproductive ground, um, unproductive messy land, the kind of stuff, the the places filled with uh, wildflowers, with scrub, with kind of brambles and weeds, we call them weeds, when they're in fact actually um, uh, really important food um, providers for insects. Insects love messy places in our environment they love a tangle of different plants and flowers they enjoy the diversity we, we've actually sort of stamp out diversity in our lives around us we want uniformity tidiness uh, a kind of manicured landscape of lawns and crops and 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 very well ordered cities that don't have weeds and plants growing everywhere and and that's actually been deathly for insects so to the extent i mean big agriculture is of course a huge problem but for those of us who you know live urban or suburban lives, and, um, you don't need a manicured lawn. You're better off if there's some some weeds here and there, huh? <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I when I spoke to an entomologist about um, what we need to do, she said, "Well, we need more of an inaction plan rather than an action plan. I mean, it's not it's not like we need to invent a new vaccine here or." Uh, some new computer program or a, a space program or anything like that. It's simply about letting go some of the, the habits we've got ourselves into. So maybe rake your lawn a, uh, a little less, rake the leaves a little less, um, maybe not have just manicured grass that you cut down every uh, every week, maybe let it grow a little, maybe have some native plants in rather than those kind of striking ornamental plants that you that you like. Um, just let things just go a little bit, Maybe maybe don't have as many um, chemicals that you put in your your yard. Um, And I know there's a kind of a cultural aspect to that. Um, Many of us like the idea of kind of well-ordered, tidy uh, lawn. Um, It's kind of socially acceptable to have that. It's seen as the ideal. But in terms of insects, it's um, it's extremely bad. And so um, there should maybe be a rethink about um, what what we should be doing uh, with that. Pesticides are a big problem, and it makes sense that they would, since they're generally targeted at insects that eat crops and other plants humans want to keep. Um, you write that there's a class of compounds called neonicotinoids, if I'm saying that right. Neonicotinoids, or neonics for short. Okay, neonic, good. Uh, they're, often, they're, they're used um, as insecticides and widely used, and you say that they don't just directly kill the the insects that they're targeted at, but they have effects that kind of ricochet throughout the environment, right? Yeah, that's right. So this is a kind of class of insecticide that's been kind of widely adopted um, in the U.S. and many other countries. Uh, and, and they're not just sprayed anymore. I mean, neonics are embedded in the coats of the seeds that are given to farmers. So often farmers don't even know that they've got neonics in their field. They're just given that by the, the company that sells them. Um, and the reason they're put in the seeds of the um, coats of the, the seeds is that they're systemic uh, pesticides, which means that they go through every kind of root and branch of, of the plant as it grows. Um, so therefore, protecting the plant um, theoretically from, from pests, the the unfortunate thing is they're water soluble so as soon as it rains they they leach out of the plant into the soils into the water therefore affecting any kind of life really that's um that's in there 
Um, and also um, the frustrating thing for, for many entomologists is that they don't really affect the problem. I mean, the peak of the pest, the pest, the target pest, actually comes after much of the insecticide is washed away. Um, so you're not actually uh, really protecting uh, crops, and crop yields haven't been shown to dramatically increase because of their use, but you are affecting bees and butterflies and other really important predator insects that would eat the pest that you're trying to keep away. So they've actually been... Um, fairly disastrous for for many insects, um, but they are widely um, used. I mean, the the cropland that will be planted this year um, in the US about, will be about the size of Texas in terms of the area treated by neonicotinoids. So it's a kind of pervasive problem. The toxicity of the um, uh, rural environment is growing and growing. Uh, the past quarter of the century has seen US agriculture become 48 times more toxic to insect life, one one study found. So the, this kind of poison is building up and up and up in terms of the, um, in terms of the uh, agricultural uh, land in uh, the US, and that has proved uh, extremely harmful to insects. You know, as we speak, I can imagine farmers who use these these insecticides and the manufacturers of them listening and saying, wait a minute, there's another side to this story. Yeah, so there's kind of big three um, pesticide uh, companies now. Um, Bayer, Monsanto, or we sub- subsume Monsanto, uh, is one of them. They're the, they're the ones that make um, Roundup. Um, they're the ones that um, manufacture a lot of these neonics. And, and their argument is, well, look, we, we help food production around the world. If the world, we didn't have these um, chemicals, then um, the world would not um, be able to feed itself. And certainly when you speak to scientists about this point, they will concede, well, yes, we do need pesticides in certain places at certain times. I mean, it's not like um, crops do not benefit at all from uh, pesticides at certain moments. I think the problem has been the over-application of them. The the sheer volume of, of chemicals going onto fields has actually been disastrous for life all around um, uh, all around there, but also has been unhelpful in terms of the crop itself because you just get into a cycle where you need more and more chemicals. So I think uh, the industry tells a part of the story. Uh, it's a part of the story that it's not um, completely incorrect, but um, it doesn't look at the broader picture. They also tend to talk a lot about honeybee hives, so managed honeybee hives, that there's kind of 90 million of them around the world, that they haven't decreased, but they don't really talk about wild bees, and I think that's kind of telling because wild bees are the ones that aren't protected by humans, aren't their numbers aren't replenished by humans. Um, they have no protection from the environment they, they live in, and, and they are in sharp decline in many places around the world. Climate change is a huge factor in the decline of insects. I mean, give us some examples of how it's affecting populations. Yeah, well, there was this assumption, I think, f- amongst uh, some scientists that um, insects would be less affected uh, by climate change than other creatures. I mean, they are, after all, they are the great survivors of our world. They've survived the five great mass extinctions that we know of in Earth's history, um, uh, where the climate changed you know, radically. Uh, but uh, uh, the more recent research has actually found that they are actually maybe more in peril than than many other types of creature in the world. There was a study showing that um, by the end of the century, um, half of all insect species will lose more than half of their current uh, range, the, the range that they're able to live in if temperatures are not kept in, uh, in check. So the actual bands of temperature, the bands of um, precipitation that insects feel comfortable in, um, as those start to shift, not many of them will be able to move. So we obviously all heard stories of fish being able to swim towards the poles or other creatures being able to kind of migrate northwards to kind of cooler climes as the world heats up. Um, insects are very limited in their ability to do that. Um, I mean, some dragonflies can fly long distances, but other than that, um, insects pretty much stick to the area that they have always been. Um, so um, there is a kind of a big worry that um, that climate change will take a, a massive dent in populations. And we're already seeing the start of that. There was a study in 2020 that found that um, bumblebee populations have nearly halved uh, in uh, North America uh, and down by about 17 percent in in Europe in recent decades, and the the bees suffering the worst have been in the areas that have heated up the most. So there are these links now being established between um, climate change and, and individual insect populations declining. 
Well, at the point, end of the book, you look at some efforts to reverse things and restore habitats and reverse or impede the decline of insect populations, um, particularly in the areas of habitat, et cetera. Um, some of this is going on in Europe, some in New York. Tell us about what you found. Yeah, so there are there are some efforts to to help um, recreate the kind of world that uh, insects flourished in, um, and there are, like you say, efforts all over the place that can be attributed to that. Um, Bavaria is a good example. Uh, the state in Germany that actually passed a referendum in twenty nineteen to um, uh, to give thirty percent of farmland over to become organic and insect friendly to put back wetlands and hedgerows pesticide used to be slashed and so on and these kind of um these kind of efforts are kind of gathering pace in in several countries um the eu has banned all the major neonic pesticides that we're talking about before um germany has is looking to shut down uh outdoor lighting that's intrusive and also um encourage people not to use um, gas powered leaf blowers very noisy of course and polluting but also terrible for for insects because they like to to gather under under leaf litter and so on. So um, there are these kind of moves underway. In the US, you are seeing um, uh, efforts at a, at a kind of city level, I think, uh, mostly of all. Um, you've got these uh, laws in New York where new buildings have to consider installing green roofs, which are these kind of um, oases of, uh, of grasses and plants. Um, I saw one in, um, in New York City. It's an incredibly vibrant place to be. If, um, if, if a building owners are able to do it, it's, um, it seems like a very good idea. Um, Detroit, uh, Detroit is put placing um, bee colonies in, in kind of previously derelict areas. Um, some other cities are looking at putting patches of, of, of grass and plants on the top of bus shelters and other kind of unused spaces. So there is a kind of rethinking about how we order uh, the environment around us, that we can maybe let nature in, in back in a little bit rather than pushing it away. Uh, and um, insects will benefit from that. I mean, w one scientist said, um, what we're doing at the moment is a bit like uh, a submerged log. We're pushing the log down into the water, but um, if you let the take your foot off the log, they will it will rebound, and that's what will happen to insects because they can um, repopulate themselves so quickly. If we take away some of the pressures there, um, insects should be able to rebound. You said one counterintuitive thing that might help is eating insects. Explain this. <laughs> yes. So it seems counterintuitive, but... Um, it is the case that farming insects at scale to eat is actually far better for the environment than uh, raising cattle, for example. So um, cows um, require a lot of land. A lot of it comes from pasture that's uh, come from uh, deforestation. They cause a lot of air and water pollution. They contribute to climate change and so on. Whereas if you have just a small kind of barn of uh, crickets, you can kind of breed millions of them with a kind of minimal environmental impact. And and the the other good thing is that they're pretty good for you. They're kind of packed in protein, um, high in kind of zinc and iron. Um, and, the, and of course, in many parts of the world, eating insects isn't a kind of a disgusting thing. It's, uh, it's quite a normal thing. Um, there's about 2,000 species of insects, uh, crickets, cicadas, uh, mealworms and so on that have been eaten for kind of generations in part of the world. And the West, I think, is slowly cottoning on to the idea. You're starting to see restaurants and some supermarkets um, embrace insect-based diets, um, you know, crickets with chili on them ants dipped in lemon perhaps we'll start eating all those soon you know i began by asking you if before you got onto this subject you paid much attention to insects do you look at them differently now i do yes i do i mean i think it was about two summers ago i my um, kitchen was invaded by a kind of army of ants and they just kept marching into my kitchen whatever i tried to do to try and stop the flow of them um, patch up the hole they were coming through they would find a new way in and i think i think maybe a little while ago i'd be extremely annoyed by that but now, now i was kind of kind of fascinated and uh impressed by their tenacity and their adaptability and uh, and i've that was a consistent theme throughout writing this book and now i kind of appreciate insects in a way that I didn't quite before in terms of their 
the way that they've managed to kind of carve a niche for themselves for 400 million years uh, and survive these great events um, through their ingenuity. And now they're faced by the greatest crisis they've probably ever faced now. And um, I can only hope that um, I can only hope that we we are able to allow them a little bit of breathing room to um, to allow these very impressive creatures to to remain with us. I wonder if it's frustrating that you spend so much time writing about this and documenting the threat, and policymakers just don't seem to be moving. Yeah, I mean, it's is occasionally frustrating. I mean, I'm many many journalists in this area have kind of privately and publicly complained that you know. The, the stories that they write should be headline news every day. It should be kind of screened from the rooftops. But um, unfortunately, I think as society, um, we don't do very well with slow-moving emergencies. We we kind of react quickly to to things that are seemingly fast-paced and imminent. Uh, if you look at the response we had to the uh, coronavirus pandemic, for example, um, the world could move just as quickly to to deal with carbon emissions, but it doesn't um, and a lot of that is down to kind of vested interests uh, and kind of practice way of doing things um, the political sway that those vested interests have and so on so yeah it's it is frustrating sometimes um, sometimes it can be quite dark and despairing especially if you have um, children thinking about uh, the world that they're going to grow up in um, but I mean ultimately we are we're trying to make the world a better place, I think, all of us, for for humans, for children, um, as well as uh, all the other creatures and wonderful things in this world. So it's definitely something worth, um, worth fighting for and worth um, informing the public over. Well, Oliver Millman, thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you so much, Dave. Oliver Millman is the environmental correspondent at The Guardian. His new book is The Insect Crisis, The Fall of the Tiny Empires That Run the World. Coming up, Ken Tucker reviews the new album from singer-songwriter Mitski. This is Fresh Air. <laughs> 